<clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dennis Reardon, president of Monocotog Audubon Society, and welcome to this evening's special uh, Lights Out Connecticut program with the launch of a closer look at model outdoor lighting regulations for Connecticut. Monocotog wishes to honor the indigenous communities native to the chapter area, including the Pesset, Wepawag, Quinnipiac, Tatakit, Nunkatuck, and Hammonasset people. As we advocate for the conservation of the land and its wildlife, we're indebted to the work of Native and Indigenous people who cherished the land for thousands of years before European colonization. Our speakers tonight are Meredith Vargas. She's a sustainable building policy research and PhD candidate at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. She served as co-chair of Lights Out Connecticut from 2022 to August 2024. Formerly, she served as policy researcher for the Yale Bird Friendly Building Initiative where she co-authored Building Safer Cities for Birds, How Cities Are Leading the Way on Bird-Friendly Building Policy, which was published by Yale Law School and American Bird Conserv Conservancy. In 2023, she helped lead the campaign to pass Public Act 23-143, the Connecticut Lights Out Bill, which requires all state agencies to turn off unnecessary outdoor lights at state-owned buildings year-round. And she co-authored the document that we'll be discussing this evening. Leo Smith is the Northeast Regional Director and Lights and Connecticut Chapter Chair of Dark Sky. He works strategically to protect the night across the United States by integrating dark sky lighting principles into national building codes. He developed language used to amend the Connecticut State Building Code to cover parking lot lighting and introduced two code changes to change two code change proposals, New York State Energy Code in 2019. He's a longtime resident of Suffield, Connecticut. And our interviewer this evening is Brandon Bichelli. Brandon is a journalist, writer, nature enthusiast, and Connecticut native. He currently works for an academic publisher in Danbury and serves as editor-in-chief of the Milford Orange Times in Orange. He's also a volunteer for Lights Out Connecticut. Welcome, Meredith, Leo, and Brandon. Hi. All right. Um, I guess I will take over from here. Um, first of all, I want to take the opportunity to thank Dennis and Manukatuk for putting on this webinar, as well as Meredith and Leo for joining us to talk about these model regulations. Um, there's a lot to get to, so we're going to take flight in just a moment, if you'll excuse the bird pun. Um, we will have time to answer some of your questions later in the hour. Uh, in order to keep everything orderly, um, just type your questions into the chat. And when the time comes, we'll go through as many of them as we can. Um, so just to start off, Lights Out Connecticut published its model outdoor lighting regulations for Connecticut in June. It provides a template that municipal governments and other groups like condo associations can use to set nighttime lighting standards for a range of different types of buildings in different zones. It covers residential, commercial, and municipally owned facilities, as well as street lights, outdoor sporting facilities, and even boat docks. So Meredith, can you tell us a little more about the model regulations? What kinds of requirements does it set? Sure, so um, this document was created as a model set of regulations that a town or a municipal body could adopt either in whole or in part 
um, as an amendment or as a or as to their to their zoning code or as an ordinance. Um, so it's really um, made for Connecticut townships and um, different municipalities. Um, it can be basically adapted to the needs of the community. So if they want to emphasize certain things or de-emphasize certain parts of the regulations, they can do that. But it's really meant to be a comprehensive document that, as you said, it covers um, lighting requirements for a broad range of different building types and also zones, which are important, um, as you all know, for Connecticut planning purposes. So um, it, it also follows the, um, basically it takes its source of, inf of um, kind of the basic principles of responsible lighting from the five principles that Dark Sky and AES released. And uh, basically those cover everything from illumination levels to controls, and um, it it follows those guidelines. Um, I can also say that uh, the different types of buildings that we cover is very comprehensive. So as you said, we 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 cover uh, boat docks. We cover also uh, greenhouses. So it's a very comprehensive law. And actually, let me take a let me do a share screen and take a look at the document with everybody, so you can see just how. Um, just the some of the different requirements that it sets. Um, so it sets up a number of different, um, you know, it starts off as regular, it will look very familiar to people who are who um, work with different ordinances and things. This is kind of follows the regular zoning code or like a building code of structure. So um, it has the purpose of the law, its applicability, but this is the section here, um, section D that starts to get into the outdoor lighting rules. And very important for this document is it has a light trespass rules, rule. Um, a number of different municipalities in Connecticut already have a light trespass, but it's definitely not the standard. And this we have heard, uh, you know, from as Lights Out Connecticut, we heard from a number of different residents who will complain about um, light shining um, on their property from neighbors' properties or from outside sources. And so light trespass is something that's of a community concern. Um, it's of a property, you know, enjoyment concern. And so it's really upfront in this document. Um, it requires that luminaires should not be visible um, from a, from a, it sets um, a, uh, a measurement level and, um, and basically uh, sets out that light trespass should not be allowed. Um, I'll just say here that this document is forward looking and not, um, and not retroactive. So it wouldn't apply to lights that are already existing. It would be for any luminaires or um, lighting sources that are installed from the date of the passage of this um, ordinance or this uh, these regulations once they are adopted. So um, this would this would be for uh, kind of like sets a date and then goes forward from there. It also deals with targeted lighting. So um, where is the light shining? and the illumination level, and that is gauged along with the um, ANSI and IES lighting standards and allows a little bit of a buffer um, for those standards and also requires lighting controls. And I'll say for this uh, section D, this applies to all types of uh, luminaires and all built on all buildings and all zones and districts. So it's very comprehensive. And um, this again follows the five principles of lighting um, and I would say this is really the heart of the law. Um, it's, and I think there's one more, yeah, that it also sets a correlated color temperature that's in the warmer spectrum. So it's um, color temperature of 2,700 Kelvin or less. Um, and uh, I'll just wrap up by saying that these, um, that all of the requirements that it sets out and all the standards, they follow the best practices of, of uh, lighting practices nationally so this was so it's informed by national sources of uh illumination illumination laws but then also um even the most current that haven't been uh released yet because um this was really developed with um the input of experts from across connecticut and also a national dark sky experts so it really reflects the best in lighting practices that exist right now um, and that's what we try to do is to find a very good medium of what would suit communities without requiring too much, but at the same time, making them stringent enough that uh, people will notice the difference. Uh, townships will notice the difference when they adopt this law. So um, it's really uh, walks a very fine line of 
saying uh, what's the most that we can ask for without making it too stringent. And that we're going to cover more of the document, but that's a, I think that's a good general uh, introduction to it. Okay, thank you. Um, Leo, can you share your thoughts on what you see as the largest opportunity to reduce light pollution at the municipal level? Well, Brendan, the uh, Federal Highway Administration came out 10 years ago with a paper that dealt with adaptive roadway lighting. And what adaptive roadway lighting means is that you don't leave the street light on at full strength all night long from 11 o'clock until six o'clock, either turn the light out or maybe drop the energy output by about 70%. And it's safe. And municipalities would have a wonderful opportunity to take a look at their street lighting practices, especially where you have streets that roll their sidewalks up in suburbia at say 10 o'clock at night and there's literally no vehicular traffic no pedestrian traffic nobody's out there in one o'clock two o'clock three o'clock in the morning but yet the street lights are on and so the opportunity to take a look at what kind of technologies might be available to control those lights so they don't stay on full strength all night long is probably the biggest opportunity in terms of reducing energy consumption that the municipalities can look at. Great, thank you. Um, Meredith, why did Lights Out Connecticut create this model lighting policy for local governments? Yeah, we created this because nothing like this exists already for Connecticut or for our New England region. And we really saw a need and we heard a need from the many different residents uh, that we that we spoke to who said that they wanted to do something in their town, that they wanted to bring something to their planning and zoning, but they didn't have anything in particular that um, that they knew what to bring. Um, we'll get into it a little bit uh, in more depth, I think, later, but I will say there is a dark sky model lighting ordinance that's been available since 2011. Um, and our view was that um, it was a, a little bit complicated and that we really wanted something that was simple and also organic to Connecticut. This is very specifically written for Connecticut municipalities. So it, um, it pays attention to the Connecticut state building code. It pays attention to Connecticut state law. And it also is informed by some of the best current uh, lighting laws, um, municipal lighting laws in Connecticut. So. Um, it's inspired in part by laws in, in like townships like Canton and New Haven. And so uh, we knew that there was a need for a document like this. And, um, and we were glad to be able to put something together like this, put together a model ordinance that would be wholesale, able to be adopted straight into um, a town's zoning code. Um, so it, it really responds to a need uh, from communities. Great. Not to mention the fact that also, um, uh, I'll just say light pollution in North America, uh, or actually I'll just say in the United States is increasing every year 10%. That's what science, this, the most recent research says. So we know that if we don't do something now, that uh, the light pollution problem will only get worse and cumulatively and exponentially get worse. So we knew that there was a real need to address the light pollution now and also for the sake of, you know, lights up. Uh, Lights Out Connecticut, we advocate on behalf of birds, but we saw that um, in our state, there was a real need for it. Um, and then that this was the time to act um, on light pollution. Sure, thank you. Um, so there are a lot of myths and misunderstandings about the relationship between outdoor nighttime lighting and public safety. I think that was something that Leo mentioned uh, a moment ago. Um, often people believe that more lighting means more safety, and that's not always the case. Um, studies show that while lighting can improve public safety and reduce crime in some situations, in others it can actually enable and encourage crime. Um, so Meredith, what would you say to a town planner who wants to address light pollution, but worries that adopting a better lighting law could lead to increases in crime or perceptions, at least from the public, that that um, there might be an increase in crime. 
Yeah, that's such an important question because that's really oftentimes the the first response that if when when um a when an, a resident or you know someone who wants to advocate for uh, better lighting laws when they approach um, decision makers about passing a better law or taking better lighting practices the first response is often what about security or we need those lights those lights are there for security reasons and um, that's true to an extent that definitely lighting improves um, you know mobility at nighttime there's a lot of nighttime activity in most a lot of our communities in Connecticut we have a lot of busy cities and crime is a concern but um, what we address is good, responsible lighting practices. So that's what this the this model ordinance promotes are responsible. It's not to turn off all the lights. That would be to say it's how we do it safely and um, effectively. And so that can be everything from um, uh, using those controls, motion sensors that can turn on and off and like adopting in a lot of the technologies that have become available over the last especially the last 20 years um, that are actual requirements in a lot of green buildings I mean the the, the Connecticut State Building Code already requires um, it already requires the use of of lighting controls at uh, new buildings so in some ways um, some of this already recognizes that Using lighting controls, I'm oh, sorry, I'll just say what lighting controls are. That's the use of things like timers, automatic dimmers, and uh, motion sensors, so that you're using technologies so that it's adaptive to the environment of like the light is used when it's needed and not when it's not needed. So um, we're, I feel like that discussion has already happened because it's already required at the state level for new buildings, at least controls are. Um, and um, things like, you know, you can say for, I'll just give an example, like, um, a car dealership. Those are those uh, kinds of business, businesses often use a lot of nighttime lighting in and all night long because of uh, you know property theft concerns. But there is a way that you can ad use adaptive lighting even in those kinds of settings where you can dim them seventy five percent, fifty percent, even, um, and then also use motion sensors with um, cameras uh, for security reasons. So. More light does not always mean more safety. And it's really to use it intelligently and to employ or to use the technologies that we have in smart ways. So I'm, are, we advocate with this law for smart lighting and not just more lighting, to use it in smart ways. Leo, if a, if a city or town adopts these model regulations, how could a homeowner in that town or city follow the requirements it sets while using outdoor light for security? How can homeowners use outdoor lighting to maximize security and yet reduce light pollution while following the regulations? Good question. There are actually two ways to do that. Uh, Meredith has touched on one, which is the use of motion sensor lighting. But let's step back a second you know, if you have a property and you want to have some type of security, if you provide outdoor lighting that's on all the time, you're also providing a roadmap to anybody that's looking on where everything is. On the other hand, if you keep your lights out, but they have controls in them, like, for example, motion sensor activated type lighting, if there were a case where someone trespassed onto the property and tripped the light and the light suddenly comes on, what does that do? It scares that trespasser away. They don't wanna take the chance that maybe someone saw them. If you use motion sensor activated lighting, that's wonderful. The second opportunity is to make sure that all of your lighting is without glare. And the reason for that is that the more glare that you have, the less you actually see. It's sort of like uh, the, the, at the extreme when someone shines a flashlight in your eye, you see the light, but you don't see much else. And if you really want to be able to see well, you want to make sure that you don't have any glare coming at you. So those are the two things that a homeowner can do to make sure that their lighting system works for them as far as security is concerned, to the maximum extent possible. Yeah, that's great. Actually, Leo, can you explain or can you define glare and then 
And then maybe say how, uh, how glare is addressed in the model regulations, the kinetic, these model regulations that we have, because not everyone knows what glare is. Well, glare is basically the light that's coming directly from the light source into your eye. And the, the glare has been recognized by the Illuminating Engineering Society where they actually have ratings for light fixtures. They use the letter G and then you could have a G0 or a G1 or G2 or G3. The higher number that you get, the more the, there is glare. And these are all lab tested. So getting a light fixture that has G0 is the best you can do. Great, thank you. Um, so now turning to street lights, um, which are also a significant uh, source of artificial light at night. Um, this is again a question for you, Leo, because you're an expert on this topic. Um, so you worked to help pass legislation in Connecticut that requires shielding for street lights. And Lights Out Connecticut's model regulations re require most street lights to be controlled and programmed to automatically turn off from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. when traffic volume is still very low. Um, can you explain how street lights can be programmed to comply with this rule? And on top of that, um, what kinds of technologies can be used to reduce light levels during that time period? Most, most street lights operate on photocells, either individual street lights, like the type that are attached to wooden utility poles, or a bank of lights, like on an interstate highway, where a single photo cell will control the entire bank of lights up to say 120 street lights or an individual photo cell for an individual light like the type on the wooden utility pole. If you take those photo cells out and you replace them with programmable photo cells, you can program that light so that at 11 o'clock at night, the power is reduced by say 70% or even 100%. And it stays that way until five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning when it then kicks back in so that in say January, December, when you have commuters that are starting in, let's say at 5.30 in the morning to, to get into, into their job, the lights would be on for them for that rush hour traffic. But there's absolutely no benefit to having those lights on in the very late and early morning hours Another thing about streetlights is that perhaps 85% of the streetlights that are on wooden utility poles do not comply with the recommended practices for roadway lighting as far as light distribution factors are concerned. I've been on the Roadway Lighting Committee for 12 years, and the Roadway Lighting Committee sets minimum to maximum ratios for lighting that's provided by streetlights so that you don't get into dark light, dark light, dark light type of situations. That means that you have to have a minimum illumination level equal to 20% of your maximum at that midpoint between the two lights. All of the streetlights that are on wooden utility poles are spaced based on wire weight distribution factors, and they don't comply with that minimum to maximum ratio. It's so important. If we actually could take down all of the lights that do not contribute to crash avoidance, the overwhelming majority of streetlights in Connecticut would be removed from service. That's a I lot. Really think it's, yeah, it really is a lot. And, and you know, I just want to share a screen here just for a minute so we can take a look at um, the streetlight portion of the law. Let's see here. Sorry, I'm going to... Um, let me share screen with the right document here. Um, here we go. Um, it's section I of the document and it covers, um, so in addition to all the different buildings and structures and boat docks and things, it also has a, has a particular section on streetlights. And um, it's the sections uh, three and four here. Leo, do you wanna talk about these two? There's the a shielding requirement um, and then also the lighting control. Um, the shielding requirement is actually part of Connecticut state statute 
that requires that all streetlights, both those that are owned by the municipality on local roads, as well as all of those that are owned by the state DOT on state highways, all lights have to be fully shielded. And there are some exceptions, but they're very few. For example, if you're in downtown Middletown and you decide you wanna have turn of the century decorative post top lighting, you can go ahead and do that because it is accepted. And it, it, the chief elected officer in that municipality has the right to waive that requirement. But aside from that, all street lights have to be shielded. And the lighting controls part of it there was a paper that was done in 2014, 10 years ago, by the Federal Highway Administration that showed that using lighting controls like this, where you actually would have adaptive roadway lighting, so that from 11 o'clock at night till six in the morning, your light output would either be zero or maybe only 30% of what it was when it was on full strength, is it's safe to do. There's nothing inherently unsafe about it. So as we get into more competition for energy, when you have all of these people owning electric vehicles, driving them home at night, plugging in their chargers for overnight charging, that competition is going to become pretty severe. And so taking streetlight energy and diverting it to hmm. charging batteries makes a lot of sense for everybody. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Thank you very, very much, okay. Leah. Um, I'm sorry, did you want to say something, Meredith? Or? I did, yeah. I just wanted to say is that um, this is not, again, because this the, the model regulations as they're written here uh, for Connecticut, they follow best practices. And um, in a lot of these uh, standards and requirements have been already applied in other cities and towns. And um, Leo, you know that, uh, is it the city of Phoenix? in Arizona, they have it's, this it's requirement actually of lighting. In, in Tucson, Arizona, about maybe five or six years Tucson. ago, they adopted a uh, adaptive street lighting practice where from 11 o'clock until six o'clock, all of their lights are dimmed. And uh, there hasn't been any adverse consequence to that. That practice is still going on. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's just a really important note is that if a large municipal, a large metropolis like a Tucson, like a large city, if they can do adaptive uh, street lighting, then it certainly should be safe and um, and doable for uh, Connecticut communities and, as well. And Connecticut also has a special rate where if you turn your light out from midnight until I think it's six o'clock in the morning, there's a special rate that the utility company applies so you don't have to pay the same as you would if the light was on all night long. Yeah, and I'd like to just add a footnote here, which is if we look at the times and when we're asking people to turn them off, Leo said, you know, that's when most people are not on the roads. Um, you know, there are people who work late shifts, people have, um, you know, activities into the evening, but generally, um, you know, most people are home from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. and most activities are sort of, you know, uh, are, 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 are kind of, that's when most people are going, you know, in bed into things. So that's a, just by, that is also the same time when we ask people as Lights Out Connecticut um, to turn off their lights for migratory birds. Um, and so this, it, it just so happens that this is the exact same time. It's 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. And again, and I'm just going to scroll up now to the D section, which is really the um, the center, uh, like, you know, the, it constitutes the main section of the of the law. That, again, this also uses that same time frame, turning off lights from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. And that's the same time as what's in our state uh, law at Public Act. 23143 is it uses that same time of asking people or requiring people to turn off unnecessary lights from 11 to 6. So this is a way that um, that's just becoming uh, the norm is for lights, for adaptive, for the use of adaptive lighting uh, during those times. Great. Thank, thank you for, for that in-depth answer. Um, so a law is only as, as effective um, as its enforcement. So if a city like West Hartford could pass the best lighting law in the world, 
But if it's not enforced and residents don't comply with it, um, then it wouldn't do much good. So Meredith, how does Lights Out Connecticut's model regulations ensure compliance? And, and does it address the challenge of enforcement? Yeah, so um, this model, these model regulations are written to be adopted as part of a zoning code, or you know, if they're adopted by a condo association, they'll be become part of an existing policy, at least that's how they're envisioned. And because of that, there should already be structures in place uh, within the code to require enforcement. So you could have a zoning code violation or things like that. Um, but um, um, yeah, so, uh, but the, but, um, sorry, uh, there's a, some movement. Okay. Uh, So basically, um, you have you have the enforcement that would happen through that mechanism that would already be in place for that code or for the zoning code or for the for the building code, whatever um, you know mechanism that it's adopted into. Now, enforcement, as we all know, at least for those people who are interested in lighting, is a challenge because it can be difficult because uh, lighting these lighting rules are often passed at a moment in time and they're not retroactive. So it's sometimes hard to know, was that lighting, was that problematic lighting installed before or after the law was uh, was passed? But um, where you can where you can show that this lighting was uh, installed or you know upgraded before, um, but sorry, after after the um, regulations were adopted, then um, then you can bring a, a complaint with the zoning code or um, other the, the existing mechanisms to address it. But um, we would be very interested to hear about different types of enforcement. Like um, um, we know the town of Greenwich, you know, they just passed the most comprehensive municipal lighting law in all of Connecticut. Uh, the town of Greenwich just did that. Um, I think it became, it was passed in March. It's extremely comprehensive and they are actually adding a very strong enforcement mechanism to it where when they see that there are non-compliant um, uh, lighting, lighting uh, sources, they're actually going, the, uh, the town administrators will be sending letters of notice to, uh, to those property owners who are non-compliant. So it really can also be um, what a community decides it wants to do to um, enforce the rule, but um, as it is written right now, it doesn't have an, an additional enforcement, um, you know, mechanism beyond what already exists. But it does say, um, actually, you know, let me let me just take a look because there is one aspect of it that goes beyond um, what would be required um, in most current lighting municipal lighting rules is that it requires the submission of different types of lighting plans. It requires actually a lot of. Um, uh, you know, uh, submission of of plans in the design phase um, for for permitting purposes. So in the permitting right. process, it it sets requirements there. So there are additional requirements to uh, make sure that people will comply once they're installed. Uh, so that's that's a really important part, and that's I think it's like a four or five uh, different requirements for um, for b building permitting purposes. Okay, um, Leo, kind of shifting gears a little bit here, can you explain the relationship between light pollution and climate change, as, as well as explain how adopting model outdoor lighting regulations can help to reduce our carbon footprint? Sure. The... Um... Department of Energy, the United States Department of Energy actually did a study on outdoor lighting that showed that literally 99% of outdoor lighting is wasted. That is to say that if you wanted to light a path, how much of the light actually illuminates the path and how much of the light actually goes elsewhere, anywhere from into the sky, over into the woods, into the fields, into places where you're not really intended for illumination. Um, all of that light pollution and wasted energy represents a problem with climate change. So to reduce the energy, you need to reduce the light pollution. Now that's not gonna solve the problem in its entirety, but it's certainly gonna make a contribution in the right direction. 
And that's where we get into the idea of that 11 to 6, maybe you should leave the lights off. Do you really need the lights on all night long? No, you don't. Um, and probably the biggest difficulty is going to be on an emotional level where people have a fear of darkness. And that fear probably generated when they were little kids, they were afraid of the dark. And that carries with them when they become adults. But that's not rational. It's just what it is. It's an emotion. And so if we can find ways to address that, I think we'll go a long way. Because it's not just a question of light or not light. It's also a question of degree. When you have a full moon, you have two one hundredths of a foot candle of illumination. And yet you're able to see the pathway. You're able to see the rock that's in the path that you have to walk around. You don't need a lot of light in order to be able to navigate. And yet by our standards, we say, hey, if you have a parking lot, you should light 10 times brighter than a full moon. Really? I don't think you need that, but that's what the rules say. It's just we need to be more prudent. Great. Yeah. Um, so the, the leading organization working to reduce light pollution globally, which is uh, Dark Sky International, they published a model lighting ordinance for towns and cities in the U.S. in 2006. Um, similar to Lights Out Connecticut's model regulations, it offers a template for municipalities to develop and adopt outdoor lighting standards to reduce light pollution, glare, light trespass, and sky glow. Um, it has been adopted by dozens of municipalities across the country, uh, and I guess it informed the uh, town of Greenwich's new lighting law as well that we just spoke about. Um, so Meredith, what is the difference between Lights Out Connecticut's model regulations and Dark Sky's model ordinance? Why did Lights Out Connecticut decide that the state needed a model lighting regulation of its own? Yeah, I think I mentioned before um, two things. The first thing is that um, there's really two sources of law for this, uh, two sources of, let's say, standards for these model regulations. And the first one I mentioned was the International Dark Sky Association and the um, IDS. This is um, the, um, the five principles for responsible nighttime lighting. And um, those directly informed the writing of this model of these model regulations. Now, those did not exist as a set of five principles when Dark Sky wrote its model ordinance, um, those that over like well over a decade ago, so long ago. So since then, um, it's really the 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 formulation of of, of outdoor lighting, um, you know, principles or approach has really been distilled into these five principles. And, um, and those are actually the way that um, these model regulations are organized. So that section D that I keep talking about, that one's actually almost exactly mirrors the five principles. And actually, let's take a look at those uh, five principles because I have a really uh, wonderful graphic. So let me share my screen here and we can take a look at it together. Okay, so here is, um, here's our document. And if you go, um, so here are the five lighting principles for responsible outdoor lighting. And it's the it's dark sky and IES is the illuminating um, engineering society. So basically um, when I when I we talked about section D before, it almost exactly follows this structure. Um, it talks about targeted lighting, um, low level, which is another word for illumination level. So how bright is the light? using use of controls, which is number four. So we have a lighting control aspect. And then um, our model regulations also has a, a requirement for uh, warm spectrum or, you know, a 2700 Kelvin, um, uh, you know, correlated light temperature. And um, so our model, unlike, unlike the dark, ironically, even though it's dark sky again, but it's the dark sky model um, ordinance does not follow in this structure. They actually have, um, and they organize their uh, model ordinance, if you look at it, as uh, 
into basically four zoning sections going from sort of like high density, like commercial areas or more residential and then lower and then to almost like a non, you know, a non-developed areas. So it goes, it really organizes its uh, its lighting requirements by its zone, by these different four zones. So, and it has different requirements for each of the four zones, which makes it uh, extremely detailed and comprehensive. And I think effective if, you know, as, as, um, as applied, excuse me, but, um, but it's a little bit complicated, especially for some of our smaller townships. I mean, I was in um, Andover, Connecticut. They have a lighting, they have a lighting loss, I think for, for a number of years now, for at least three or four years. And it's extremely simple. It's only about three or four sentences long. It basically gets at the heart of what we're looking at on the screen right now. It gets into the, the real essence of a uh, light responsible outdoor lighting, which is targeting the luminescence. And, and um, with our model regulations, we had the idea that um, it could be, we don't need to, to do it by zones. We can do a general rule, set of rules that are, that are, um, that are strict enough that they make a difference, but they're actually also, um, you know, lenient enough for some of the commercial light. They're, they're pretty flexible. Um, so, uh, that's probably one of the, the main reasons. And the other way that it's different is that um, our sources are also light, local lighting laws in Connecticut. So um, the co-author, Mike, actually went through all the different lighting laws across the state and uh, looked at what are what are different townships doing and what can we draw on that are best practices. So because of that different sections of different local lighting laws in Connecticut were lifted and put into um, this document. So really this document is both inspired by the best practices and principles of the dark sky five, you know, the five lighting principles and also informed by Connecticut's own municipal practices. So it's very organic to Connecticut. So I'd say that's why um, we think that uh, Connecticut townships, t Connecticut planning and zoning, they'll recognize this, this, um, the structure of the law, and they'll know that it's, it's really intended for Connecticut's, uh, Connecticut communities. So that's how, those are probably the main, uh, the main ways it's different. Fantastic. Oh, but I should say, actually, um, yeah. we'll, should, we'll say that Dark Sky, uh, International is intending to release a new, um, do you want to talk about that, Leo? Uh, there is a new uh, document that they're going to be releasing probably sometime in the fall that will also deal with outdoor lighting. And the main difference will be that its document will be national in scope, where it really won't be directed like Lights Out's document is directed specifically to incorporate state building code requirements of a particular state and the state laws that have been passed in regards to light pollution controls and things like that, whereas the Lights Out document does incorporate all of that. So uh, there are some benefits to the fact that this is uh, Connecticut-centric. Connecticut-centric, yeah. Um, we're, I'm eagerly awaiting the release of that document. I cannot wait to see what the new dark sky uh, model ordinance looks like and to see how it's different from what we've created if they have in, kept in place those that different zoning um, structure that have how they organize their current model ordinance or if they're going to go for a more general approach like we have. I should say it's ours is general, but it also has special categories, as you saw, for street lighting, uh, dock and boating lighting, and then um, and greenhouses, which are a growing concern for, you know, um, for nighttime, uh, for nighttime growing industries and things. So um, ours has specialized sections but um, but really the the bulk of of zones and uh, buildings are all have uh, are all kind of they're all mandated re lighting requirements are in section D. So that covers the bulk of, of, of structures. Thank you both. Um, so we are getting close. We're just past a uh, quarter of seven. Um, I do have one more question, and then we will turn to some of the questions that people asked in the chat. Um, so, Leo, uh, how can municipalities generate public support for adoption of these model regulations? What can they do? 
the first thing that needs to be done is a matter of education, public education, where there has to be an understanding of why we need to address this. And why we need to address this has to do with the fact that you have adverse consequences to light pollution that affect climate change, that affect animal habitats, bird migration, all kinds of issues. The American Medical Association has issued a paper on its adverse effects to human health. And if people understand that nearly a billion birds die every year because of outdoor lighting, it goes a long way to help them understand that what we're talking about doing in terms of reducing light pollution is not something where we're taking away, but we're actually adding, we're adding value. So there's not as many adverse consequences as there used to be. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, just will, I would like to just yeah, put ahead. a footnote just to that because the new figure, staggeringly, uh, Leo, it, that just came out, I think, in the last four or five months, this is up to 2 billion birds are killed in this country every year due to window collisions. And uh, research shows that uh, outdoor lighting or nighttime lighting, um, both actually indoor and outdoor, nighttime lighting is a contributing factor to those collisions. But it's two, up to 2 billion birds every year killed in collisions with uh, glass surfaces um, in our country. And, um, and yeah, and like I said, light pollution is a contributing factor. That, that what, there are studies that show when you turn off nighttime lights, you can reduce the number of collisions significantly. And the more that people understand the problem, the more willing they're going to be to help with the solution. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to, to turn to um, some of the questions from the audience. And we'll, like I said at the beginning, we'll get through as many of these as we can. Um, we will, uh, I think, both Meredith and Leo are okay with going a few minutes over the hour uh, if needed. Um, but of course, we want to respect everybody's time. So if you can't stay past that, um, that's okay. The, uh, this webinar is being recorded and uh, I believe will be uh, up for people to view shortly uh, after it's done. Um, I think Dennis can speak more clearly on that than I can. Um, in any case, uh, there's one question that that I think uh, both of you will be probably have a um, be happy to hear that somebody is asking whether they can copy portions of this document for Utah. <laughs> um, I can say because you know uh, the copyright holder for this document is Monongahela Audubon Society, which is the parent organization for Lights Out Connecticut which is why it has Lights Out Connecticut and Menonkatuck's logo on it. So um, it's technically, you know, it's it's copywritten by Menonkatuck Audubon Society. Um, but of course, um, you know, I think if, if people want to borrow portions of it, I think that's fine. That's really what it's for. It's free. It's, um, it's really for sharing. If you could give a footnote or a mention to us, I think that would be helpful. But um, it's really to, um, you know, the purpose of this is to expand and improve lighting, lighting protection, light, light pollution, you know, uh, rec uh, restrictions. So uh, I think that would be definitely fine for any municipality, whether, whatever state you're in. You just have to adapt it and know that it's, you know, this was specifically written for Connecticut. You have to do the uh, adapt it for Utah. But we purposely made it so that it could be adaptive. It says it in the introduction. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, and I think this might go into, you know, convincing people uh, to actually adopt these these regulations um, is, uh, can you point to some studies um, that show that using lighting controls do not compromise safety? Um, can you can you talk a little bit about where somebody might find some of that information? If somebody wants to contact me directly, I can send them a copy of the study that was done in Chicago. Um, they had a situation there where they had alleys that were very underlit, um, so they thought, and they wanted to increase the amount of light, figuring that that would also 
decrease problems with crime and, and safety. So about halfway through the project, one of the universities did a study on the before and after. And what they found was that the alleys that were more dimly lit were actually safer. And the ones that had had double the light actually had substantial increases in crime. So it doesn't go together that more light equals more safety. But that doesn't get around the fact that some people feel that way. You can prove to them that the cows come home that more light doesn't equal more safety, but yet they feel safer in a lot of light. So that's a that's a big problem that we have to get over. But in the reality of things, there are studies out there. And if someone contacts me directly, I can actually send you a copy of the Chicago study. And Leo, how can uh, how can people contact you directly? Uh, my email address is my name. It's leo at smith.net. Great. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I just dropped into the chat um, a link to Lights Out of Connecticut's page that's all on safety, and there's a number of studies that are cited there. Um, and also, I just want to reemphasize the fact that a lot of these requirements, I mean, I'm not saying a lot, but I'll say for the, for the lighting controls, uh, a lot of the lighting control requirements are already in place at the state level. Um, there are just slight, slight modifications of those. So it shows that there's... It, it, there's a recognition um, by by uh, you know people in charge of public safety, like our our legislators, that that um, that light that reducing light pollution in ad adopting these kinds of um, you know adaptive lighting is safe for um, for the public because they obviously wouldn't have that requirement in place at the state level in the state building code for um, new buildings if to to have uh, you know lighting controls if it wasn't safe. So it's sort of, I feel like it's an, it's an obviated issue because it's already been uh, proven. And this is what's required for all new green buildings. It's what's required by LEED. It's, by, it's what's required by, um, you know, different uh, other states have it in their building code. So the whole issue of, is it safe to use adaptive lighting is I think we're past that. That's what, what would be my point. It's like, I would just, I would also point to those other laws that say, look, other states are doing it. And um, and that we have to get up to speed. Like we need to get up to date with our with our uh, rules as well. Um, another question came uh, about whether the document includes uh, anything about highway lighting for the states, such as I ninety five, I eighty four, and those are obviously outside of municipal control. Um, but uh, but if you want to just just address that quickly, maybe Connecticut. Department of Transportation uses 207 lighting systems that involve 23,472 lights throughout the state of Connecticut. And right now we are in touch with them to actually find out exactly how much energy and what monies are spent in support of that because the step after that will be to go to the legislature to talk to them about requiring that the Connecticut Department of Transportation start to use adaptive streetlight practices to reduce or eliminate the amount of light that's used from 11 o'clock at night until six in the morning. Okay. I mean, um, it's a noticeable difference. I'll just say quickly is that if you drive um, in different parts of Connecticut, some highways have lights, some don't. And you could go to other states like Massachusetts, you could be on a pretty major, uh, uh, you know, throughway and they will not have lights. And so when you see how varied the different approaches are, you realize that there's no one, um, there, there is no uniform approach and that there's obvious like public, public safety can be achieved through less lighting as you can go through some really long stretches of, of like, uh, of, of, of New York state on major, major uh, throughways without having any Street light. So it's a really, I think that points, I mean, Leo, can you speak to that? It, it almost seems like it's a, a preference, let's say. It's a preference in some cases. There are some, some predetermined factors that go into whether or not you light. One is what's the traffic volume on a daily basis? Now, what it is on a daily basis includes the rush hour traffic, 
But what about that traffic volume from 11 at night till six in the morning when the heart lose anybody out there? Uh, there are, the, the traffic volume is the key driver. There's other factors like if you have highways that have very close exits, one next to the other, there might be an additional need for lighting in that situation. But where the exits are three or five miles apart, there's no need to light. And so it, it goes on and on, like the exit ramp in Connecticut, if they light it, they light the entire ramp all the way from the start of the ramp all the way to the end. But there's other states that all they do is they put one light in right at that point where the exit ramp and the main highway meet. At that point, it's lit. But there are reflectors that are used embedded in the in the dirt around the the contour of the of the ramp that guide the driver on how they have to handle that car. They don't need to have overhead lighting to be able to figure that out. Right. Um, so earlier, uh, you you mentioned things like um, uh, car parking lots um, and auto dealers and things like that being lit. And, and somebody was asking whether the uh, whether the uh, regulations or um, anything that might be affected by them would address things like commercial sign lighting. So like some of those, some of the big signs, um, like neon signs that you see on uh, uh, commercial properties that are often lit up all night. Meredith, you want to take that? Meredith, maybe? Yeah, I was just trying to pull up the document here because I uh, there are some exceptions to the to the rules, and actually um, there are quite a few rules at the state level and also um, at the uh, at, in different municipalities that cover illuminated signs. So um, our our uh, regulations they have some exceptions for um, certain kinds of signs, um, but I think um, you know the certain types of illuminated signs are allowed, but. I don't know if someone's talking specifically about like some uh, really the more egregious ones, but the, the unfortunate thing is that in the state of Connecticut is that billboards are allowed and they use a lot of illumination, you know, that's their whole intent is to be viewed and read, you know, at all hours. Um, and so um, a lot of those like spotlighting, um, um, those would be uh, partly covered by the model regulations. And the model regulations also prohibit the use of electronic messaging centers, which shows the billboard where it changes every five or 10 seconds. That, that would be prohibited um, if a municipality were to adopt that. That would mean that electronic messaging centers would not be permitted. Okay. Um, and I guess this is, a, this is sort of a related question. Um, how difficult is it to apply adaptive lighting for something like a grocery store parking lot or, you know, the, another big box store like that? Um, adapt, adaptive lighting in particular. It's not difficult at all because the technology is simply the programmable photo cell. Instead of having your standard photo cell is dusted on, a programmable photo cell will allow you to use a mechanism to set a variation from let's say 11 o'clock until six, where either the light will be reduced down to 30% of what it was before or be turned off entirely. The ideal situation in that parking lot, if we're talking about after business hours, turn the lights out, have them activated by motion sensors. If someone comes onto the property, the lights will come on, they'll stay on for 15 minutes, if no one is around at that point, they'll go off again. It's worth looking, you know, here we have a whole section under uh, section E. We have the illumination of signs. So um, they'll use light fixtures so that they point downwards. You know, we, we do cover the illuminate, uh, illuminated signs and things. But there is a whole section here on parking lots. And I just want to emphasize that they, that all lighting must comply must comply with the lending control requirements in section D, so um, in D4. So that's all the lending controls. 
So um, just like Leo said, with this, with these model regulations is that parking lots would also have to conform to those adaptive lighting principles of like either dimming or using motion sensors or um, automatically turning off. And I will want to say one more thing, as I was talking before about billboards, is that under our prohibited lighting is that in under our model regulations is that it prohibits billboard and rooftop signs from being illuminated um, at night. So that would be one big one big difference. Um, and, and again, this is all adaptable. So if you have a township that really feels that it needs to have that for some reason, like you could remove that clause. But this is, as we would say, is a best practice is that you actually don't have billboard and rooftop lighting, um, uh, you know, after after hours. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, um, how do you make a utility such as Eversource, or I suppose uh, UI, um, follow these regulations? Um, and they give an example of once upon a time, Eversource updated all the streetlights in their condo complex to 4,000 degrees, and no one had asked them to do that. So I don't know if, um, I don't know if that's something that, that uh, you can answer, Leo, or? It's, it's um, very difficult to get the utility company to comply with the laws that currently exist. Um, the one thing that you can do is you can file a formal complaint with the Public Utility Regulatory Authority. And if they get enough complaints, they probably will do something. We actually have done exactly that with the utility company when they first came out with a law that required shielding and the utility company tried to get around it. And we filed the complaint, they held a hearing, they scolded the utility company and made the utility company put up good lights in 22 municipalities, 10 lights each municipality at shareholders' expense as a basic form of punishment for the way that they ignored the responsibilities previously. Great, thanks. Um, all right, we're going to do uh, one more question uh, because we're uh, a little past the hour already. Um, but this, I think, is, is an important one. Um, so the document says that these regulations apply to new construction, refurbishments, and upgrades. Um, can you explain what a refur refurbishment or upgrade is considered? Um, and would these regulations only apply when a building permit is issued? If yes. we're talking about refurb refurbishment yes. and upgrades. Yes. When, if you have to apply for a building permit, You've got to follow these rules. But if you're not in a situation where you need a building permit or an application for a permit, then these don't really apply to you. Oh, really? Um, yeah, but what about if your neighbor decided to install floodlights in the backyard? If they all of a sudden decided to install all night on floodlights, those would, those would still be captured, right? Any installed luminaires? Effectively, in theory, yes, you're right. But in practice... There, we just don't have the manpower for people to go out and police people that do whatever they do in their backyard. Mm -hmm. It's really a, a, an application process where there's review and processing and a vote to approve and things like that. It's the only effective mechanism. All right. Um, okay. Did you have anything that you wanted to add to that, Meredith, or...? I, uh, I mean, I think as it's written is that it's any that are installed. It doesn't doesn't necessarily restrict it, but I think this comes at, back to that issue about compliance and enforcement. It really does come down to, like, I think that's what Leo Leo's uh, talking to is, like, how do you ensure that every single light that's ever installed complies? Because there's, you know, you could have a very large municipality and there could be, like, tens of thousands of people. And how do you how do you monitor 10,000 lights? But I do think that where, you know, if you're in a town, a smaller township, and suddenly, you know, you have some uh, neighbor who uh, installs some egregious lighting, and, you know, I think that it would, it would count. Um, at least I think that's how it should be treated. Um, but I think it's also a, a question about enforcement, and, um, and it might be a municipal, it, it might depend also on the size of the municipality and the community. You know, if, if you adopt this for your condo association, for sure. 
you know, it, it just would depend on um, on both the authority that, that adopts it and then what their level of um, enforcement is going to be. Yeah, that can, can be a tricky thing, I know. Yeah, it really is. It's a tricky one. All right. Um, so we are, uh, we're just about 10 past the hour now. So I think we're going to let's wrap uh, up. Um, Let's uh, let Carol Bramley make her comment before we br break up for this evening. Oh, we've got a hand up, okay. Carol Bramley. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I'm here. I was just going to say that lights on residential properties um, have to get a, a electrical permit from the building inspector. So the building inspector has control and it's an interesting thing to think about because I think that as a zoning enforcement or a zoning um, commissioner, that that would be something we'd want to address if we're adopting regulations um, and make the building inspector very aware of as well. They definitely would ha could have a larger role to play. And I, I think there are ways. What, what would be your um, suggestion then, Carol? Um, could you say again, what, how would you uh, do the enforcement or compliance piece? You can address it from a zoning standpoint with a zoning permit. But once you have an established house, somebody doing electrical work has to get an electrical permit. Um, and most of the contractors are pretty good about doing that. So it's a matter of having to find a way to get the building inspectors to cooperate and either also include the um, the regulations in their review so that it's carried through. Unfortunately, particularly in small municipalities, there are a lot of entities within the town level that have different aspects of different um, portions of what goes on, um, whether it be residential properties or commercial. For example, houses, you have the um, public works department involved with driveways and it's a separate entity. So uh, it's a matter of having everybody work together for the same goal. That's so interesting, Carol, because we see the same thing with uh, bird-friendly building uh, standards. Sometimes when they're adopted is that the building inspectors and the people who sign off on the building or at that at that later stage that they don't always are familiar with all the different requirements. So are you saying that would be a matter of like training and having them uh, know to look at the lighting piece again, to, to look at lighting as part of their review process at the end? I think so. I mean, we've gotten cooperation. I'm in a relatively small town, but we've gotten cooperation in terms of solar panels and things that uh, land use has jurisdiction over, but the building inspectors issuing the permits. Um, in small towns, it's a little bit easier because the staff pretty much knows each other if you can get them to cooperate. Um, in bigger municipalities where there's a lot of staff, it would be a much more difficult um, task. Thanks for, thanks for adding that. That's really important and to make it really particular to um, municipal, you know, organ organizational uh, structure and processes. And that might be a, a very uh, interesting opportunity there when you talk about electrical permits required that uh, when an electrical permit is issued for outdoor lighting, that maybe there would be a requirement for the applicant to also supply a lighting plan to show conformity with the regulations in terms of shielding requirements and light trespass and so forth as a condition of getting that electrical permit. Actually, if I can just add towns that have design review, additional lighting could come under the jurisdiction of design review, which is really under um, zoning and the land use activities, but that would be another opportunity to have an impact. Good suggestion. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'll just say, um, I know we're we're about to wrap up, but if people have, Leo has already <clears throat> um, offered to be a resource for people. Um, if people would like to have more uh, support or if they have questions about this, <clears throat> about these model regulations or how they can bring it to their planning and zoning or how planning and zoning could adopt this in, <clears throat> of course, Lights Out Connecticut is a resource um, in addition to Leo. 
Um, so we would we would just be very supportive of communities that want to think about how to use it, how to adopt it, and how to adapt it as they see fit. And that we want to be, um, you know, that we can also help with the uh, legislative discussion portion, which we did in Greenwich, is that we went and testified. I can say I testified before the planning and zoning and helped to explain some of the details of it. So we just want to be resources for people as they uh, move towards adopting this and making it um, part of laws in different municipalities. So think of us as resources. Well, thank you, Meredith. And, and thank you, Leo, for, thank for staying with us for the hour. And thank you to, uh, to the audience for your questions and, and for sticking with us as well. Um, I guess I will turn it over to Dennis now to close us out. Yes, thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, Meredith, Leo, Brianna, for uh, an excellent discussion. Um, as I said, the recording will go out uh, sometime tomorrow in an email to everybody that uh, registered for the program. So with that, uh, thank you and good night. Good night.